Well, welcome, welcome, welcome this morning. Sorry a bit a little bit musty in here, but we'll we'll be good. We'll be good. We'll make it through today. We're sure glad everyone's here this morning, and uh, we'll just kind of get right through our little service for our announcements and so forth. Don't forget, next week we're gonna have beef hot dogs, big those big thick beef hot dogs, and we're gonna get some chicken strips from across the street. And so the worship committee is providing for the main meal. And then we're just asking everybody to bring a side fixing salad, uh, dessert, you know, whatever you'd like to bring, beans or something like that. Because we're sort of like a July 4th picnic type uh, style of uh, lunch next, whoa, next uh, Sunday. And we'll have that ready not too soon after the service next Sunday. So we appreciate all your help and participation in that. And that'll be our uh, service for next Sunday. And then um, and then we'll be going into the month of July. And one thing we might, if you're interested, be sure to tell some of the folks like uh, Dale and Carl and so forth. If you're interested, last year we went into the uh, sanctuary, uh, the fellowship hall for services for a month or so. Because it is a little cooler on a easier to cool any one Sunday. If you're interested in us doing that, be sure to let folks like that know. Let me know if we have enough interest, then we can do a full month of service in the fellowship hall, and if that would make it a lot easier for folks today. So uh, that should take care of that. Any? He's going. Good morning. Yeah, I, I came down early and turned the air conditioner on, and it was doing fine. And I realized that it's not doing fine now, but the uh, compressor stopped running downstairs, and that's what runs the system. So we'll see what's wrong with it. Maybe we'll have cooler air next week. Would you like to rise and join me in the call to worship? <clears throat> I will sing to the Lord, for the Lord is highly exalted. The Lord is our strength and our defense, for the Lord is our salvation. The Lord is our God, and we shall praise him, we shall exalt our Father God. Who among the gods and the stars are like you, Lord? For the Lord is majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working many wonders. May we honor and glorify our Lord this day.
maybe if it's warm in here, Mark won't talk so long. Okay, please bring me the invocation. Dear God, thank you for this beautiful summer day. Bless those who are present today that they might receive insight into your word. Bless those unable to be with us today. Bless those who are joining by electronic media. Open our hearts and our minds to your message today. We ask that you be with our, our leaders of this service today. Fill them with the Holy Spirit and also those present that they may be encouraged and inspired to be your servants. In the name of your Son, amen. Yet in like manner, evil people rely on their imagination and the dreams. Immoral people defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme religious and angelic beings. But when the archangel Michael contended with the devil, disputing about the body of Moses, Michael did not accuse nor pronounce judgment upon the father of lies. But instead, Michael said, the Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme those things which they know not. But what they know naturally, like wild animals, in those things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them, for they walk in the way of Cain, and run greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward. For they shall be judged like Korah's rebellion, and they shall perish. O oh, gracious, loving, most merciful Lord, we thank you for the words that you speak to us today. And though we're in an environment that's a little warm for us, help warm our hearts and our spirits to know you greater and to study your word and to look to your scriptures for guidance and direction in all that we say and do. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Well, here we are back in the book of Jude. Now, for a real quick review, Jude was one of the four brothers that are named in the Gospel Council, one of the brothers of Jesus. And none of them followed Jesus as the Messiah while he was here on earth before his death. But they all became his disciples once they encountered with him in the resurrection of the dead. And all these brothers became leaders in the first Jewish Christian communities with Judah acting as a traveling teacher and missionary. And all of this sort of gives us a quick background on which to understand the purpose of this letter. Now, we don't know specifically what community Judah is writing to, but it's mostly uh, made up of Messianic Jews. And his writing style assumes a deep knowledge of all the Old Testament scriptures as well as some of the other popular literature that was associated with Jewish literature. Like, I remember a few weeks ago we looked at the book of Enoch and the book of Jubilees, which uh, Jude had, Judah had referenced in some of these writings. And Judah had become aware of the crisis that was facing this church. And it helps us get a little better idea of the design of Judah's letter as he begins to openly charge a long warning accusation against corrupt teachers who had invaded and were now influencing the church. Judah wants the church to know that the appearance of these teachers really isn't a surprise. Even Jesus talked about be aware and not be deceived by so many others. And that much of this letter is a warning to stay away from false teachers that have crept into the church unawares. And many of you might remember a few weeks ago that Jews cited three stories from the Old Testament of an example of God's judgment for those who lie and cheat and deceive others about the truths of the Bible. For all unbelievers in Christ, 
will receive judgment from Christ himself, according to the scriptures. Now, you might rem remember that the first judgment that Jews mentioned was about all the rebellious Israelite people who received divine justice from God in the days when they were wandering in the wilderness. The Israelites rebelled against God in the wilderness. Now, they got what they wanted, but they were barred from entering the promised land. In fact, that whole generation died in the middle of nowhere, and only two survived. That would have been Aaron and, uh, I can't remember the other name, of the two that survived to go in with the new generation of Jewish folks to enter the promised land. Now, the next story Jude talked about was God's judgment on the 200 rebellious angels led by Azel, who left their heavenly abode and had relations with the daughters of men and gave birth to those Nephilim giants. And great evil occurred during the days of Noah and sinned against all birds, beasts, reptiles, and humankind. And God pronounced judgment upon those 200 angels and cast them down below hell into the outer darkness until the day of the great judgment would happen at the end of the age. Then Jude, of course, offered up the example of Sodom and Gomorrah. And that was the final example of God's judgment upon the blasphemous unbelievers who engaged in immoral, unnatural, debauchery type of behavior and as violent men tried to forcefully have sex with those angels, as you might remember that story. And both of those last two stories were about rebellion against God and specifically showing about sexual immorality and how it seems to have corrupt teachers. And some of these teachers had come into the church and Jude was reciting some of those as examples of what some of these teachers sadly were doing. And while these stories might seem a little odd to us, for the Jewish people who were raised in this literature, Judah's warning really makes a lot of sense. For the behavior of many corrupt teachers even today have ancient roots of where this first began and started. Rebellion against God's authority, things like sexual morality, rejection of God's angelic messengers, that's nothing new and should not take Judah's listeners for granted or by surprise. And that all connects to our second trio of examples that are mentioned in our response to reading this morning about the rebels who continue to want to corrupt others. And Jude gives us insight for today that what evil unbelievers are sort of like today in our world. I mean, even folks today, some of these evil folks seem to rely upon their own imaginations. They rely on their own dreams. They, they escape from reality and they center their lives around their own beliefs and practices. And they live in a dream world so reality isn't really there for them. And they're not really thinking biblically. They believe in Satan's fleshly lies. And so many, sadly, today in, in our country are influenced by the lies of the enemy. And for these dreamers, for these immoral people, they defile the flesh. They reject authority and, and blaspheme different type of religious or Christianity and angelic type of uh, spiritual enhancements, just as in the days of Noah, just as in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. And we live in perilous times, too. Wouldn't you sort of agree with that? I mean, could we be living in the days that Jesus talked about, these days of Noah that would come back to haunt the, new, the world? And I think one of the greatest concerns that I have with the Christian church and for Christian believers is we were all created out of love. For we love because God first loved us. And we believe upon the death, the resurrection, and the coming again of Christ. We believe upon that he died for our sake and that we might eventually live in the heavenly kingdom as we claim our faith to believe upon the grace, mercy, and works of the Lord Jesus the Christ and that we are saved by faith and not through any work of our own. Yet we forget that we're really at war not with the flesh. I mean, Satan's at war with the flesh, and he's doing a great job of getting us participating in all these little fleshly desires and stuff, isn't he? 
But we forget what most Christians have been taught. That as Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 6, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the rulers and against the authorities and against the powers of the dark world. And these evil influences, after attacking the flesh, then they invade our soul. And you start believing, you start acting upon those destructive, evil, lustful, selfish, fleshly indulgences. For the struggle of the flesh will limit our growth of our spirit. So the more you struggle in the flesh, the more it's going to limit your growth spiritually with God. I mean, we can't grow if we're always feeding our fleshly desires first, right? I mean, we can't recognize this spiritual battle before us when television and computers and cell phones seem to be dulling our senses. I mean, Jude understood that the son of perdition will never stop hounding you. He'll never stop pulling on your desires and tugging on those temptations and whispering in your ear and saying, Hey, it's okay. You can do that. You can justify doing that. And Jude tells us that the archangel Michael, when he contended with the devil about the body of Moses, well, Satan kind of continued to try and defile. It shows that Satan will continue to defile and try to even go after you and your dead body, even after you're dead. I mean, he sure tried to keep Moses out of heaven, didn't he? And I can guarantee you, he's out to get you and me too. And when Judas trying to tell his fellow Jewish believers that these evil people will not stop that they will continue to badger and continue to harass and insist that their belief and their practices and their theology is the only true way. And we see it all over the media today, don't we? I mean, pride in myself, pride in my sex, pride in my color, pride in my money, pride in all the stuff that I own, pride in all the power that I have and that I continue to have over you. And for every time someone is proud, don't forget that there's someone else on the other side who's extremely jealous of that proud person. For wherever there's pride, there is jealousy. But notice in this great story where Michael the archangel confronts Satan over who's the rightful owner of Moses' body, notice that Michael doesn't start name-calling the son of perdition. Michael doesn't start condemning him for all the atrocities that he's committed. Notice Michael won't even listen to the great adversary as he, as the adversary is trying to petition about why he should be able to receive Moses' body. See, Michael tune, tunes out all of Satan's lies. All Michael chooses to do and say is, the Lord rebuke you. And all we need to do to ever rebuke Beelzebub is to reprimand this enemy and to lash out against the God of this age is to let him know that the Lord rebuke you. For we are to honor and praise the God of all ages, the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. For even the other half-brother of Jesus, James, in his letter in Chapter 4, verse 7 says, Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. And guess what? Then the devil will flee from you. For Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 that though we walk in the flesh, we're not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but of divine power to destroy our spiritual strongholds. We have divine power that's been given to us by the Holy Spirit. So I guess the question is, well, how do we tap into this spiritual divine power? Well, Paul continues that he says, we destroy arguments against lofty expressions raised against the knowledge of God. So in every conversation and in every engagement that we're talking with others, we should rebuke every argument when you're talking to someone and they reject the truth of the gospel or they reject the truth of Jesus the Christ. 
We should stay away from those evil influences that cause us to do things we wish we didn't do. And you know, that the Lord rebukes evil and that the victory was assured at the cross and eternal life is possible for all those who receive and believe upon the Lord Jesus the Christ. For as Jude indicated, woe unto them, for they have gone the way of Cain and run greedily to the error of Balaam for reward. Now you might remember Balaam was a was an ancient idol that many Jews who had strayed away had started worshiping Balaam, this idol. And for they were like for they're like wild animals, Jude tells us. They're, they corrupt themselves. And you know, you can almost make that argument today for a lot of people in our country, right? I mean, it seems like there's several wild animals running amok in our country these days, doesn't it? And Jude was showing his readers that dare, that during a daring nature of this apostate conduct that only seems to destroy the church, but it can also destroy your community and how it relates to sin and judgment. I mean, way back in the book of Romans, in Paul's Romans, it describes the de degeneration of humankind. And it says, knowing the truth, but evil people suppress the truth. And who's in charge of the truth? And who tries to change God's truth into a lie and end up down that road that's called a rope eight mind? For their minds are numb to the truth of the word of God. And today, sadly, we, we live in a country who is numb to the truth of the word of God. We're numb as a country to the love of Christ. And we're numb to not having a healthy fear of the Lord. The epistle of Jude is sort of a warning to those who let evil exist and continue to exist. And Jude is inviting the church to eradicate evil quickly, rebuke evil, get rid of evil. For we are supposed to turn away from evil, abstain from doing evil, and overcome evil with good. For Jesus overcame the temptations of the devil. For Christ overcame the world, as we're told in John chapter 16. And we are to give our thanks to God, who gives us victory through the Lord Christ Jesus. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. For as it says in Romans chapter 16, the God of peace has crushed Satan under his own feet. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismay, dismay, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. Isaiah said that back in chapter 41. Do not fear. Only believe, as Mark used to talk about. And those who know and put their faith and trust upon the, on the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, have assurance that the Lord will never forsake those who continually seek Him. So may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you this day and continue to seek the Lord in all that you say and do. Amen. We'll do it again. Jesus, 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 there's just something
And now it's our time of offering. And as it talks about in Deuteronomy chapter 16, it talks about that each of us should ought to bring a gift in proportion to the way the Lord has blessed us. So may you bring your blessings before the Lord this morning. Amen. Dear Lord, we thank you for the blessings of, of this gift, and we thank you for our days today. We thank you that you accept not only our money, but our spirits and our hearts as we freely offer to you our gratitude for all the great gifts and blessings you've given to us. May we use them both in this place and wherever the need might take us to go. We thank you in the blessings of Jesus the Christ. Amen. For I received from the Lord that which I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Heavenly Father, we come to this table remembering your Son, the bread his broken body, the cup his shed blood. As we touch, taste, and take them, they become part of our bodies. We become one with Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. We thank you. You've been worshiping with us this morning. And we know you were a little warm on the outside. Maybe Christ warmed your little spirit this morning. And if you'd like to make a commitment to this, have life as your personal, have Christ as your personal Savior, or you'd like to recommit your life to Christ, or maybe you'd like to join this humble church and establishment, you're welcome to come forward during our closing hymn this morning. Uh, one announcement I forgot to bring up is next week, uh, the deacons are going to be having a meeting at 8.30. Is that right, Vivian? In the parlor at 8.30 next uh, next Sunday. And they need to go over. We're going to have a little small change to the service. And it might affect the deacons just a little bit. So if you're if you can come, it won't, shouldn't take too long. But we're going to try to make it a little bit smoother for those folks for our summertime transition. Now, when you read our little story this morning... From Jude, you might have heard this story about the rebellion of Korah. Does anybody know what the rebellion of Korah is all about? Well, let me give you a brief summation about that. Numbers chapter 16, if you want to read it, it's, it's quite lengthy, but it's a great little story. Anyway, basically Korah was a Levite. He was a cousin of Moses, grandson of Le Levi. And he's in the part of the Levi tribe, and him and two other gentlemen named Dathan and Abraham grouped together as a group and formed other little groups. And they went to Moses and Aaron and said, you're not the only leaders of Israel. God can speak through us as well as through you. And so they rejected the authority of God through Moses and Aaron, and they rebelled against them. And they rejected that God had appointed a mediator of Moses and Aaron. And so Moses kind of basically said, okay, why don't everybody who is with this rebellion and against me and Aaron, why don't those who God has ordained as leaders, why don't you stand over there 
And everybody who wants to identify for Korah and the other rebellious leaders, why don't you stand over there and then we'll let the Lord show who is right. And so they separated, they prayed, and the earth began to shake. And under the feet of Korah and his followers, the earth opened up and it actually swallowed all of them and the earth closed right up above them. So around 250 of those folks died in an instant. Now how's that? For God taking care of his enemies, huh? The earth shook, opened up, and they fell into the earth, and the earth closed them back up. And then Moses pretty much said after that, hey, anybody else want to rebel? Go right ahead. That's pretty radical, I think, for Moses to do so. And as we learned in the epistle of Jude this morning, Cain rebelled against God's authority. Balaam rebelled against God's authority. And then we see Korah rebelled against God's authority. You know, they rebelled against God's authority in service. They rebelled against God's authority in salvation. They rebelled against God's authority in separation. They rebelled against God's authority in sanctification. Maybe perhaps the lesson we need to learn today is not to rebel and go against God's authority. Yet today, the world rejects the authority of Christ. But as it says in Matthew chapter 28, Jesus said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. May we remember that Jesus said in the great old gospel, John chapter 14, I am the truth, the life, and the way. No one can know the Father except through me. So today, may you know Jesus, know God, and you shall receive salvation this day. Let us pray. Oh, gracious Lord, as we conclude this time of worship, we, rescind all, we surrender all to you. May we continue to grow in the knowledge of your truth. May we be aware of God's just punishment and our Savior's great reward. May we continue to offer our praises, our prayers, and our lives before you, your people, and your church. May our worship offered here this morning may be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. May we pray that the truths that we have encountered today will take root in our hearts and our spirits and bear fruit in our lives. And we seal this time of worship with gratitude and our thanksgiving to you. In the name of Christ Jesus, we give our thanks and praise. Amen.